So, um, well, first of all, how I met everyone was the other night I was in the service station um, where Peter works, and I was on my way home from a conference, and uh, my battery had died, and so I didn't know where I was going. I was staying in Miller at a friend's house as a missionary evangelist, and because um, I, I didn't want to know my way home, I just pulled over in the service station to charge the battery, ask if I could charge my battery for a few minutes, and um, while I was in the service station, I was just loving on everyone that walked in, and um, uh, in terms of just sharing the gospel and and you know telling people Jesus loves them, and I think I prayed for one or two people, and uh, and Peter and I got talking with Peter while I'm waiting for the phone to charge, and he said, you know, his dad's pastor, and you should come and check out and that they're doing an outreach this afternoon, and I, well, and that's what I live for. So my story is, um, I grew up in a Christian home uh, when I was a child of a uh, traditional Pentecostal church here in Australia in Toowoomba, which is about an hour and a half west of Brisbane. Had, uh, when I was a child, we practically lived at church. I was at church four to six times a week in terms of Bible studies and youth at Sunday school and all the different services that go on. Um, and the home I was in was a very strict disciplinarian type home. As a teenager, I bought the lie of the devil um, that the world is, you know, you can have fun and you can be good like they do in the world with, without having to obey all these rules. And so I ran off into the world and uh, at about, so I finished high school and I transferred down to university in Brisbane. And within about six months, and I started going to the nightclubs and, and got involved with people that were taking drugs. Uh, within about six months, I got addicted to drugs uh, by the age of 19, and it just got worse and worse and worse. By the age of 19, I um, was a heroin addict. Uh, up until about the age of 24, I had a thousand dollar a day heroin habit. Um, but I was very business minded, so I owned a, I was still paying off part of a nightclub in Fortitude Valley. And um, then, uh, yeah, and it got worse and worse. I, I moved in with a lady, and up until about the age of 23, it, I got to the point where I had about a $3,000 a day drug habit. And we were laundering drugs and, uh, sorry, making drugs and laundering money all through the nightclub system. It's a very corrupt, evil system. But all that was just surface of what was going on in my heart um, because of the family I grew up in. Anyway, uh, eventually, by the age of 24, the police caught me for everything I was doing. Now, I believed God was real, and I kind of had this idea that I wanted to live my life, have fun, and then when I was old, Pray that sinner's prayer on my deathbed and make it to heaven, you know. And um, that same kind of mentality I was applying to the police. I was too smart, they'll never catch me, you know, it'll all be okay. But then all of a sudden, one day the police got me. And uh, I got sent to jail. And I was in jail about six months and I was laying on my bed one night the night before I was going to get sentenced for some of my crimes. And as I was laying there, I was just thinking, what am I going to say to the judge? It doesn't matter what I say, I'm going away to jail for a very long time. Right there and then, God spoke to me. Now, I didn't hear a voice, I didn't see anything, but in my heart it became so real. And he said to me, how would I like to be standing before him on judgment day trying to come up with an excuse for hell. The whole pending doom, it's too late now, I can't change it, I'm stuck here forever. Like, I'm stuck in jail for a long time. God kind of used that to, you can't change eternity. Eternity is forever. And, and you know, the whole idea of waiting for that judgment, knowing what's going to happen on judgment day, it's just the worst feeling. You can't change it then. And um, so the fear of the Lord came on me, and I got saved. Now, in the beginning, I didn't necessarily want to go to heaven. I just didn't want to go to hell. But what happened 
was I came into a family that has an amazing, loving father. And so I met God who is love and he just loved on me. And that love healed a, a very broken person. And within a very short time after that, all my addictions just melted away. I did a couple of years in jail, but when I got out of jail, I met uh, my amazing wife. Um, maybe I'll show a picture later. We're married now, we've got eight children. Um, eight, by the grace of God. Well, number, so my oldest is 15, and number, uh, number eight's coming, 23 weeks, Amanda is. So, um, God has been so good to me. He's just, he's, he is love, he's amazing. Then when I got out of um, jail, I went to university. Yeah, so I got out of jail, met my wife, went to university in uh, Brisbane, did a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering, went to, Q, uh, to Boeing, which uh, designed the big planes, you know. Here in Australia, they do contracts for the military. And then uh, an opportunity opened up for me to go back to university and I was doing a PhD scholarship, one of the most amazing kind of something I'd always dreamed about actually since I was a little boy. And, um, and so for that first six years as a Christian from 2002 to 2008, you know, God came into my life, this amazing loving father, and he healed me and he got rid of a lot of stuff that was destroying my life. But... And I was a Christian, I'd come to church every weekend and read the Bible most days and like to get on the guitar a bit and worship the Lord. But I didn't have power from on high to be a witness. I couldn't tell anyone about Jesus. And uh, this, even though this amazing God had changed my life so radically, I, I was flat out just, you know, because I was in um, a professional culture and the academic world, I, I was flat out telling people I was a Christian. For me, being a witness meant I didn't go to the pub with the boys on Friday afternoon, you know. So, um, but six months into my PhD, I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit, I don't know if you're aware, facilitated by the Lakeland Revival in uh, 2008. Uh, a pastor by the name of Todd Bentley. And uh, it just changed my life, seeing the miracles that were transpiring. I saw 55 people get up out of wheelchairs in 14 days. Um, and, and the main message was, hey, listen, guys, you know, this is what God does. And God is with you, and he will do this stuff through you. These are the way God is revealing himself. He said, get out there and tell people about Jesus, and you will see God do miracles through your hands. And I thought that was amazing. You know, I've been in a Pentecostal church for six years, and I'd never seen a miracle. The first time I saw miracles, I was, and they were pretty, you know, what we read about in the Bible, right? Um, just amazing level of miracles. 35 people got raised from the dead in 120 days. It was just, wow, mind-blowing stuff, you know, for someone who's very academic. Anyway, um, I... Uh, I just, I just started doing it at, when I was on my way to uni of the train, I'd start little by little because I was so <clears throat> under the fear of man, so worried about what people thought about me. But God, by his Holy Spirit, gave me power to be able to overcome that fear. It gave me the love to be able to tell people about the truth of eternity. So very quickly, um, very quickly I went from a place of... Um, of just having eternity tacked on to the end of my life. The more and more I shared, the more and more I started to see that in Australia, you know, it's something like nine out of 10 people are on their way to hell. And we have an incredible responsibility to, to tell them. And I started to, I'd be able to walk down the street and just be able to see the darkness that surrounded people. And you could even tell the sons of light, you know, like they're glowing, but they're not reaching out to the ones lost in darkness. And so within a few months, I realized I couldn't continue my PhD anymore. The only thing that matters when we stand before God on Judgment Day, doesn't matter what degrees you got, how many houses, cars, all that stuff, the only thing that, that you can take to heaven with you is people. And so I, uh, I stepped out. In, that's a little bit more of a story. I was able to step out in 2010 and just went full-time after the gospel. 
And then I entered into a three-year period. God arrested me and he said, stop, wait, I want you to pray for three years. So from 2010 to 2013, I just prayed about eight to 16 hours a day and, um, and read the Word, studied the Word. And uh, so, um, yeah, since 2013, I've been a full-time evangelist. My heart is just to go around sharing with people wherever I go. That's how I met Peter. Um, and... Uh, but over the last four years, God's connected me with a lot of other evangelists around Australia. Each year we do an outreach called Schoolies for Jesus, which is um, where now, this last year, there's about 120 evangelists, but just believers, sons and daughters, came together and merged on the Gold Coast to, um, to love on schoolies with the truth of Jesus. And there's a little video clip I'll play about that after lunch. Last year we saw about 1,250 young people give their hearts to the Lord at schoolies. Does anyone know what schoolies is? So a lot don't, okay. So it's kind of, there's about 30,000, 40,000 youth, uh, grade 12ers. When they leave high school, they all go to the Gold Coast and have a big party. It's like a drinking, uh, drug, sex, a lot of bad stuff goes on there. But a lot of people are looking for love just in the wrong place. And so when you go in there, you know, just with the truth of Jesus, this amazing loving Father, God snatches them, you know, back from the hands of the enemy. And, uh, but nowadays, you know, the last few years, all those evangelists, we try to work together with churches because we had seen thousands come to Jesus in Australia, but we want to see them actually come into the church and be discipled. So as evangelists, as missionaries, we just figured out that if we work together with the churches, uh, doing evangelistic events, kind of like many crusades, I guess, here in Australia, in towns around Australia, um, then we'll actually see not only people make a decision to follow Jesus, but come in and be disciples, uh, be shepherded, nurtured, pastored. Uh, when mature believers adopt a new believer and say, hey, I'm willing to make that commitment to meet with someone, week after week, you know. That's really where God's got me more nowadays, trying to work with churches to see that. So training, doing the crusade activities, training in evangelism and discipleship, doing the, obviously the gospel rallies, um, and, uh, and mobilizing. Whenever we do conferences or outreaches, the last day we actually get out there and do this. That's why I'm really excited about this afternoon at two o'clock, because you guys aren't just talking about going and doing it, you're going to do it. So I was, very honoured to be able to come and help Peter and uh, and you guys. So, but this October we're doing an outreach in Big Park, and so we're talking to several churches about coming together to do a gospel event here, and then on it'll be a week long event, and then on the last day actually reach out into Liverpool. And so that's a little bit about me, but I I can tell you this. My whole life is just really a story about this God, this Father who is loving, amazing, and His grace is unfailing. Amen.